This was that crucial point where Jesus has entered into the temple complex. He's cursed a fig tree, and he's used that as an analogy for everything that he sees going on in the religious capital of Israel at that time. That it was cursed like the tree. That he didn't like what he was seeing. And so Jesus has already been in conflict, right? We like action. There's been action. He has been butting his heads with the sacrifices, overturning the tables. He has been butting his head with the temple. And now in this story, he's going to butt his head with the priests and the scribes. So let's go ahead and begin reading. I invite you in your Bibles, Mark chapter 12. This is going to be page 848 in your pew Bible, in case uh, you need that. But uh, Mark chapter 12. And in verse 13. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought him the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with the question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses and the account of the burning bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Then one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. And noticing that Jesus had given them good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, Jesus, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbors yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far away from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. And that is the reading of God's word. Now, as you're looking at this story, um, the way it develops is a lot like an interview, right? They're putting Jesus on trial. They're asking him questions, right, in order to stump him, in order to undermine him while he's in the temple. And so Jesus is faced with these series of questions that at first seem unrelated. It's almost like you guys are probably imagining right now you're going to get three sermons for the price of one because they're all topically different and diverse. But it's kind of like I teach my high school students, right? The answer is usually Jesus. So for if, 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 if I'm, you know, interrogating them, if I'm, I'm kidding, if I'm asking them questions, right? If we're ever studying a passage of the Bible and they zone out for a few moments, they're just, you know, tuning out. And I call on them, Elena, what's the answer to this question? Uh, Jesus, 
Correct, Elena. Thank you for listening. Right? Like, it's, it's usually the right answer. Nine times out of ten, right? If they tune, tune out, if they give the answer to Jesus, it's a correct answer. And that's kind of what's happening in this story. Here, Jesus' answer, no matter what question we're talking about, goes back to God. Every single time, despite the different questions, all the same answer, it goes back to God. And so your challenge today is that no matter what issue we're talking about along the three controversies, your job is to figure out how does it come back to God, all right? So let's go ahead and jump into it. Let's look at the three controversial questions they confront Jesus with in the text. The very first one we have there is a question of government, okay? In verses 13 through 17 in Mark, and what happens here? is that they're trying to entrap Jesus. They figure um, they're trying to show him as an enemy of the people. If they can do that, they can rush him out of the city, right? That he's an enemy of Rome, like many of the false messiahs of his day. And the question is, would he support the tax paid as tribute to Caesar and lose the support of all of his fellow nationalists and Israelites? Or would he speak against the tax? They could red flag and point a big finger in his face and say, okay, Rome, get him, right? He's against Caesar. He's trying to throw away the government and get in trouble, right? He's damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. Yes or no, what's happening? And the incriminating evidence is this. Whenever they ask Jesus this question, he doesn't pull out a coin and say, well, he doesn't have a denarius on him, which is sort of a wink at it. He asks for one, and the ones who are interrogating him, they're the ones who have to pull out a coin that they're using with Caesar's image, his idolatrous image, and blazed upon it. And so he calls it over to him, and he's able to spring this trap like a mouse with a cheese, okay? Incriminating themselves, they use Caesar's money, bore the blasphemy image, give it to him, and he says, you bear the image of God, and so give yourselves to him. Now, this is, a, this is a, an ancient challenge for the people. A lot of people didn't like the tax because they knew they were God's free people. They didn't want to have to pay the Caesars and so forth. But for Christians, it's a little bit different. You go to Romans 13, what's the teaching for Christians today? No matter what government you live under, if you have to owe honor, if you have to owe prayer, if you have to owe love, you have to owe taxes, you pay that to the authorities that be, that are in place, that are used there even as a sword given from God. That's what we're supposed to do. And it's funny, you know, we live in a highly political culture right now. I mean, the partisanship is just to the nth degree. We're fiercely political. I get that. I understand the reasons on every side for why that is. But notice, just if you could just for one second, turn off Facebook, all right? Turn off Twitter. If you could just hear what Jesus is saying to the same group that was overtly political and charged up in his day, Jesus told them the same thing he's going to tell us, and that is you are wrongly prioritizing what is absolutely at stake in this moment, and that is this, not only render to Caesar, but render to God. Give yourself first to him. That is primary. Everything else is secondary. Everything else. He says, if the, whose image is on the coin? where it writes and is inscribed there, the son of the divine uh, Caesar. Whose image is it? It's Caesar, so give it to him. So the question is, whose image is placed upon you? It's the image of God. You're made in the image of God. You bear the divine thumbprint, and so you're supposed to give yourself to him. You know what this reminds me of? I think of it this way, okay? I think about Toy Story. Now, uh, you guys have seen Toy Story? How many of you guys have seen? You're so devoted, you've seen like all four. Okay, and I, I remember when the first one came out, okay? It was 1995, Toy Story 1 came out. I remember because my parents went to the movie theaters to go see it, and they did not take me. Son, never forget, never forgive, right? Like, that was, I was five, right? Like, I was upset for all of five minutes until I was distracted by something else. But, but I've, I've seen every single one of these movies. And the story, if you really, the, the Toy Story is really always the same right? We have these toys, you know, uh, led by Woody, who was fiercely dedicated to Andy, right? His owner. 
He's dutifully obligated to serve his master. He's going to do everything in his power to make sure he's happy to be there for Andy, no matter if he's in college, if he's a little kid, he's going to daycare, whatever else. And sometimes, inevitably, in every single movie, a problem arises where they're distracted or they're brought over to some other purpose. And there's always this moment in the movie. It's a theme that arises over and over again. What always wakes them up to the fact that they need to go back to Andy and help him? You guys remember? At some point, Woody would sit down, he'd put his foot up, and what's inscribed at the bottom of his foot? Andy. It's a reminder. Inscribed on the bottom of our feet is God. We belong to him. We're obligated to him. We're made in his image. We find full freedom and purpose and love whenever we are serving him. We're to give ourselves dutifully to our God, right? And this God is so amazing that not only do we have him inscribed on us, but he says in Isaiah chapter 49 that I've inscribed you even upon the palm of my hands. That's the God we serve. And so dutifully render yourself to God. That's the point. Here's the second controversy that we're given in the story, and that is the whole question of resurrection. Looking now in, in Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27. Now, the Sadducees were just one of innumerable Jewish sects at that time. And what made them unique was that they were sort of, uh, they were the aristocracy. They were more influenced by Greek culture in that day rather than uh, the Judaism of their time. And one of the weird beliefs that they had, I say weird because they were definitely in the minority, is that they didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in the resurrection, and they didn't even read beyond the Torah. They didn't even really read beyond the first five books of Moses in the law. That's kind of what they kept to. And so what happens here is that by rejecting many other Old Testament writings that explicitly refer to God raising the dead on the last day, Jesus actually proves the resurrection to them ingeniously by quoting from the only books they saw as authoritative. He quotes from Exodus chapter 3. Now, he couldn't say Exodus chapter 3 because they didn't have chapters back then. So he says, hey, you know, in that story about the burning bush. And he says, what does God say there? He doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham, I was the God of Isaac, I was the God of Jacob, but of course they're all dead now, they don't exist, so, you know, the dead don't rise. Even hundreds of years after they had died, God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for all of the dead are living to him. Here's the ancient challenge. Jesus is countering the prevailing false Greek ideas in their day of the afterlife. Even the Jewish ignorance of the afterlife, because while not common, there are indeed references of life after death in the Old Testament. I mean, of course, they, a lot of them weren't found in the law, like Jesus points out. But we have Ezekiel 37, where it says that all these bones shall come together and these bones shall live again and put on flesh. We have Psalm 16, where the Messianic king talks about how his flesh would not see corruption. We have Isaiah 25, where God promises that one day in the great day, the great shroud of death that covers all of mankind will be removed. We have Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, where it talks about that on this day, some will rise up from the dust of the ground to everlasting life and to some to everlasting shame and contempt. It's not everywhere, but there are a few glimmers of the resurrection in the Bible. And the point is this. Jesus says, you're mistaken with your little mock question, with your little jokey hypothetical situation, because you misunderstand that in the resurrection life, it's not going to be the same as now. One example of where it won't be the same is that there will be no marriage. We'll be like angels in heaven, he says there. We'll be looking forward to the glorified, super-physical existence, renewal of all things, free from the curse and Satan and sin forevermore. But do you know how it goes back to God? Why were they mistaken? Why were they wrong? If in the first controversy he says, render to God what is God's, in the second one he says, you're wrong because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't know them. You don't know your Bible. You don't know what actually is being taught there. As a matter of fact, you're a teacher of the people, and you don't know what God has revealed about himself. And on top of that, you don't even believe in God's power. 
which sort of ties your hands behind your back because you can't even be creative to realize all of these promises that God gave that one day death will not have the last say, but you will be raised to everlasting life in your body. You don't believe that God can do it. And then finally, the last issue, thirdly, is the issue of the greatest commandment. This was a popular question, not just posed to Jesus, but to many people in that day, as you look there in verses 28 through 34. Now, what happens here, just to kind of set up the context, is that Jesus is put into a very popular dilemma or issue, okay? It was very popular Jewish practice in Jesus' day to sum up the entire law. Do you guys remember how many laws we have in the Old Testament? How many laws do we got? 613, Jim, thank you. 613. 613. It was a common practice in the Jews' day to boil it down to its essence. Like, let's just see if we can just kind of briefly summarize the 613 commandments, positive and negative, of God's law. And so you have this in your Bible. You have things like the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, the things given by Moses there. That's a good summary of the law. Not to make any other gods, uh, to honor your father and mother, don't commit adultery, so on and so forth. You have passages like Psalm 15, where David classically tries to boil them down. And what does he say? He says, who shall dwell in your twin, who shall stand upon your mountain? He who is blameless, uh, who, who does not lie, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Probably the most famous one is Micah 6, 8. Some of you guys have that written on your walls or somewhere in, in your car or something, right? But he has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God, all boiling it down. Now, Jesus enters into that dilemma, and notice what he says. Jesus, what's the greatest command? You got 613 to choose from, by the way. He quotes, in his Spark Notes version of the law, he quotes Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 5. The Shema, the ancient Jewish prayer, Shema meaning hear. The Jews would pray in the morning and the evening. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh alone. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. That's the first and great commandment. And interestingly, notice how the question is worded there in chapter 12 and in verse 28. Did you notice that he just asked what's the most important law? He didn't say, hey, Jesus, what's your top two? He says, what is the most important law? But Jesus doesn't just say, love the Lord your God. He says, for good measure, the second is like it. Quoting Leviticus 19 and verse 18, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Whoever is in the world, your neighbor around you, love them as you love your own self. Do to them as you would have them do unto you. Treat them that way. And those two comprise the greatest commandment. They're so similar to each other that they are integrally related. There's four things I want to draw from this real quick. Number one, love is something you do with all of your being. Do you hear me? Love, despite the many abuses that we use with this word, just throwing it to and forth to mean anything we want it to mean today, typically infatuation and so forth, or sexual love. Love is in the biblical imagery, is something you do. You might not always feel love for a person on the side of the road, but you are obligated to serve them as your neighbor. Love is something you do with all of your being, not just for God, but also for your neighbor. Number two, love for God is closely intertwined with love for neighbor. They are brought together by Jesus for a reason. Whenever we love our neighbor, we're loving our God. And when we really love our God, we will love our neighbor. Number three, Look at verse 33, chapter 12. Verse 33 says that our love for God and for neighbor is even more important than all of the sacrifices, all of the prayers, all of the incense we burn, all of the communions we've been present to, all of the songs we sing, all of the psalms we memorize, all of the pages of the Bible we have read, all of the people we convert, all of those things, love for God and love for neighbor is higher than anything we could ever do. All the sacrifices of the Jews. 
And lastly, look at verse 34. This is being close to God's kingdom. He talks to the guy. And again, I've debated with this as Amber and I studied this passage together. I didn't know if this guy was being genuine because in Mark's parallel account, it seems like he's saying the guy is in with all the uh, interlocutors and, and, and interrogators there kind of trying to undermine Jesus. So I don't know. But notice what Jesus says to this guy. When he affirms that that is the greatest commandment, Jesus says in chapter 12, verse 34, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, time out there for a second. Sometimes when we hear kingdom, that's a word, a vocabulary word that's so laden and overcharged with different meanings that it might be hard to hear what Jesus is saying. He doesn't mean kingdom as in church there. That's not what he's saying there. The word kingdom there just generally means the reign of God, the dominion of God, the authority of God, the rule of God. He says, you are close to God's reigning in you. God is in charge whenever you obey these commands. In other words, put it like this. What would it look like when God is heard and he is loved with every fiber of our being and all of our neighbors are caring and sharing for each other because they're made in God's image? What would that look like? Or we could say it this way. What would it look like whenever God's word is known and his power is believed, like the Sadducees. Or put it this way, what would it look like whenever those made in his image are freely giving themselves to the creator, knowing at the core of their being that they belong to God? Jesus says, it would probably look like God's ruling and reigning and sitting on his throne. That the world would finally look like it was always supposed to look. And that is that God is really in control and all of creation is really underneath his loving rule. That's probably what it looks like. And that's why Jesus said, verse 34, you are not far from the reign and the rule and the dominion of God. My question to you this morning is, how far are you? How far are you? from the kingdom or the reign of God in your life? That's my question. Here's what this story is actually about. We talked about three crucial issues that Jesus is confronted with while he's there in the temple. But here's the sad part, okay? Three points. That's the end of the sermon. We can land the plane here, Tyler, okay? I'm ready for lunch. We could land the plane there if all of these questions Jesus was bombarded with were sincere. If there were really questions from those who were sincerely seeking him. But they weren't. All of these questions are a part of a bigger picture, a bigger point that Mark is making when he writes to us this gospel. These are questions from opponents of Jesus. These are people who didn't want to listen to Jesus. They don't like Jesus. They're not a fan of Jesus. They're trying to undermine him, not really learn or listen. They came to him with closed minds and earmuffs upon their ears. That's what's happening. And this is why this whole section actually begins with a deadly parable Jesus told. Mark has told us these questions aren't legitimate when he says this in Mark 12, beginning in verse 1. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he, the rent, then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. And at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, they beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them, and they struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son, a son whom he loved very much. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. 
come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest Jesus because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him for a while and went away. This is the last week of Jesus' life. From here on out, in our series to the end of the year, we will be looking and talking exclusively about Jesus' death in a depth that I've never uh, done before. All the portraits leading up to Jesus' death from here on out, since 40% of Mark's gospel concerns his death, will be dealing with that exclusively. He is into Jerusalem. He has challenged the temple, the sacrifices, and now the priest, replacing them each with himself, and he will die for it. He will die to become for us the final sacrifice to end all sacrifices. He will die to be the dwelling place of God in our midst. And he will die to be for us once for all time a great and faithful high priest after the order of Melchizedek to forever intercede for us in the presence of God on our behalf. Amen. If you're not a Christian this morning and you believe that Jesus is that sacrifice, that he is the dwelling place of God, he is the temple in our midst, he is the high priest who has given himself for our sins, for your sins, to forgive you so that you could be brought into a confident place standing in God's grace. Why don't you put on Jesus Christ in baptism? Why don't you make the Lord your own? Why don't you proclaim your allegiance to Jesus Christ? If you have any need whatsoever, come right now while we stand and sing this song for your encouragement. Sing.